All right. Here we go again, back to basics Bible study. I am your host, your facilitator, your teacher for the very hour. I am Reverend Corey Evans Sr. Um, this is our virtual um, Zoom Bible study, um, which we have entitled Back to Basics Bible Study. This is session 80. Oh my God, we've been through 80 sessions already. We started when the pandemic hit, uh, this is our virtual weekly Bible study, and God has blessed us to continue it. And, you know, if you're faithful in small things, <laughs> you know the rest, and God is really moving with bigger things. We will have that announcement coming very, very soon. Um, but thank you guys. And those of you guys that are viewing by um, presently, currently in the moment by Zoom or the conference line, I thank you. I love you for being so diligent and being so faithful, not to me, but to the ministry. Uh, and unto the most high God for coming on every week, because you have a desire to learn of his word. And I pray that it is blessing you. And those of you guys that are on by YouTube, if this is something, this content is something you're interested in, God's word, which you should be, uh, I just actually hit the subscribe button, like this video. And so YouTube will push it out to other people how it works if, if YouTube sees or views that you subscribe and you like it, it will push it out to people without them even knowing it. And because they figure if you like it, someone else will like it. So like all the videos, subscribe, like all the videos, comment, share, do those things, hit the notification bell to where you're prompted every week when I post new videos, amen? Amen, so let's get started. This is session 80. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 26, through 28 is what we're going to try to cover, okay? And as you know, uh, in our basic outline, this is the section, the ending of the book. We're dealing with the decline of Saul and the rise of David, okay? We dealt with Samuel, judge, prophet in Israel, which was chapters one through seven. We dealt with Saul being the first king of Israel, uh, which we view David, but the, the history dictates that the people asked for a king and God allowed them to have a king that they asked for that they chose, which was Saul, was not the king that God wanted. He wanted a man after his own heart, which was David. So now we see the decline of Saul and the rise of David. Okay. Uh, so that covers chapter 13 through 31. And we're in chapter 26. Okay, we will try to cover chapter 26 through 28. So let's get started. And as I always tell you, and I get comments, these names always throw you for a loop. Most of the names, the importance is not in how you pronounce the name. The importance is that you know the storyline and what is going on. Okay, all right. So let's get started. Chapter 26. Your study Bible starts off with the heading of chapter 26 that says, David spared Saul a second time. Hmm. Go back to the last session. We remember what happened. David was hiding in a cave, him and his men. Um, Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. And um, of whatever reason that means to relieve himself, he went into the cave to um, get a break or to relieve himself. He did not he was not able to see David or the men hiding there. Uh, and David could have very easily snatched his life. Okay, come on in, guys. Very easily he could have taken his life, and he did not. He spared his life because David is a righteous man. He's a man after God's own heart. And he spared Saul because why? God never told him to take the life of Saul. God told him that he would be the new anointed king, but God did not tell him to ever take the life of Saul. Um, that's what we have to be very careful of. God may give us one assignment, and we have a tendency to carry that over into a lot of other avenues. That's not, and that's not what God intends. Be very specific. God is very specific of your calling, of your assignment. Oh my God, you got me preaching before we ever start. God is very specific of your assignment. He's very specific of your calling. So rest in that and operate in that. Don't carry over into something else that God did not tell you to do. Amen, somebody needed to hear that. Okay, so let's pick up chapter 26. It says, now the Ziphites came to Saul in um, Gibeah saying, is David not hiding in the hill? opposite of Jezimai, okay? They're letting him know 
where David is hiding. Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness, okay, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness. Now, I just said that Saul, that David spared Saul's life, okay? David spared Saul's life. David made a lot of decrees saying, I am an evil man. You are a righteous man. You are a holy man. You could have taken my life and you did not, okay? He turns right around, he turns right around, and verse 2 says, Saul arose and went down to the wilderness, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness. He's still seeking after the life of David, okay? Still. Verse 3, Saul encamped in the hill, um, which is opposite of Jezumon by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness. So Saul encamped in the hill, David stayed in the wilderness. And he saw that, come on in, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, okay? He was, from his vantage point, he stayed hidden, but was able to see everything coming and going, okay? That's what you need to know, not the struggling over what the names of everything is. You need to know the location and how David was set up, okay? Um, very skilled in military uh, things. Verse four, David therefore sent out spies, and understood that Saul had indeed come, okay? Verse five, David arose and came to a place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, okay? And Abner, the son of Nir, which was the commander of his army. And now Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped around him, okay? Now, let me, I meant to put a note in there, but let me make sure to say this, okay? This was, this is just a common practice. If the king or the leader, especially the king, was with the army on some type of excursion or some type of military venture, their first responsibility was to protect the king, okay? Even when they are sleeping, they are to protect the king. And I should have put an extra note in there so you can have it, but write this in because this will make sense to you. At the end of verse five, where it says, Saul lay with Lord lie within the camp with the people encamped around, all around him. Why did it word that? Imagine one person in the center and their circular ranks around him circle after circle after circle of troops encamped around all around him to protect the king that's what that means why is that important because it's going to make it real to you even more special when you see what happens next okay so you need to know that put that in your notes that's what they mean when it says the people encamped all around him the common practice, the military practice of that day was the king was in, if the king was there, the king was in the middle in their circular um, formations, that's what I'm trying to say, circular formations all around him, circle after circle, going out from small to large, encamped around him to protect the king, okay? And it says um, that Abner, the son of Nir was the commander of his army. So keep those two things in mind. Okay, verse six. Then David answered and said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, um, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? Who will go down? And it said he was speaking to Ahimelech and to Abishai. He spoke to those two saying, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you if I'm pronouncing that correct. Okay, Abishai. That little note you see was just my personal note to make sure I try to pronounce it correctly. Okay, verse seven. David and Abishai said to the people by night, came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head and Abner and the people lie all around him. 
So David and Abishai came to the people by night while they were sleeping. Verse 8, then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. That sounds familiar? That's the same thing he was told in the cave, okay, that, that God delivered Saul to him. But because David was faithful, David knew God had not told him to take the life of Saul. Remember that. Verse 8. God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth. And I will not have to strike him a second time. I'll make it quick. I'll make it clean. And all your worries are over. Okay. And where it says to the earth, that means he was going to take the spear and go impale straight through the body all the way to the ground, making sure that he was dead and pent to the ground, okay? That's exactly what that means, okay? But look at verse nine. But hmm, David said to Abisha, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against God the Lord anointed and be guiltless? Let me say it again. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Oh, my God. Who can stretch out their hand against the anointed of God and remain guiltless? No one can. Get that in your spirit. No one can. Okay. Verse 10. I mean, just look at the character of David. David said, furthermore. As the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. But did he say this is for me to do, or did he say it was the Lord to do? It says the Lord shall strike him. Why? Because David knew God had never told him to take the life of Saul. What is, what is this a prime example of? It is allow God to fight your battles. Allow God to deal with your enemies, people. God created you. He created your enemies. He created all living things, heaven and earth. Why are you worrying about someone rising up against you? Why are you worried about someone at your job? Why are you worried about any person in your presence? Why are you worried about people you see during the day? Why are you worried about people even in your own family? It doesn't matter. Anybody that has come up against you, it, it come up against your ministry. Why are you worrying about that? In this case, the enemy is coming up against David's assignment to be king of Israel. Why are you worrying about someone coming up against you, allow God to fight your battles. God never told David to act against Saul. So he remained faithful in that. And his blessing comes from that. Amen. Amen. Let's go. Let God fight your battle, people. Okay. Verse 11, the Lord forbid mm, that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. So David is dealing with two different principles here, guys. He's dealing with allowing God to fight his battles. And he's dealing with this is God's anointed. And he is the king. And he should not come against the king, no matter what the king does to him. Mm. David just moved himself out of the way. If you don't agree, with the anointed, oh my God, just about to bless somebody. If you don't agree with the anointed that you are under, if things are happening that, that, that you don't agree with, that you feel that you can see in your spirit that, against, that comes against the word of God, don't go against the anointed. Remove yourself out of the way. Go get good ground. Go be established in good ground. Don't be foolish and stay with unprosperous ground. 
remove yourself and attach yourself to good ground. That just blessed somebody. Okay. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please, you listen to this now. Take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. Mm, we're going to see why he did that. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head and they got away. And no man saw or knew it or awoke for they were asleep. Get this now. Because a deep sleep from the most high God, the Lord had fallen on them. Mm. Is God not fighting his battles? Okay. I just explained to you the formation of which they went to sleep, how it was their job for all. That's why it specified how many men it was. Men of valor, men of battle, great warriors. It explained how many men it was. I explained, that's why I stated that. That's why I stated they were encamped all around them because you can see the mighty move of God. If you didn't take notice of those simple facts, you wouldn't know the great importance of how God just moved. He caused everyone to stay asleep. He calls David and his, his man to come walk throughout all these troops to get to the center to get to Saul. You see how amazing that was? You see how amazing that was? And you might've missed that if you didn't pay attention to those two little facts, okay? Verse 13, now David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off. Where, why? Why did he do this? He was far enough to where they couldn't reach him and he could get away safely, okay? And stood on top of a hill afar off, a great distance being between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner, mm, the commander, do you not answer Abner? Mm. Then Abner, Abner answered and said, who are you calling out to the king? Abner was the commander, okay? So when David called out to his enemies, now the enemies were allowed by God to awake. Mm. Isn't that something? So David said to Abner, are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? He's the commander. Why then have you not guarded your Lord, the king? Wow. Oh, if this not throwing shade on somebody, I've never seen it before. For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord, the king, Saul. This thing that you have done is not good. Now, is he going against the anointed? No. Is he speaking against the anointed? No. He's going against the first in charge to bring the awareness of what just happened, okay? As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the judge of water that was by his head. Mm. Then Saul knew David's voice. It's not the first time he heard it. Is that your voice, my son, David? My son, huh? But you went to kill him. David says, it is my voice, my Lord, uh, but small m, small l, my Lord, O king, not the most high, not the Lord, not Yahweh, small l. And he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? Here we go. David is putting it together. He's putting it together again. He's saying, why are you coming after me to seek to kill me when I have done you no harm? He said, for what have I done or what evil is in my hand? Verse 19, now, therefore, please let my Lord the king, hear the words of his servant. Now listen to this dialogue. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. Him, capital H, him, the Lord, the most high. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. What does that mean? Does that mean David was about to serve other gods? No, I put a note in there. That means 
that's exposing or possibly exposing him to other gods is what that means. So that means he was driven out for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord saying, go serve other gods. They pushed him out or ran him away. Why? Because he feared for his life. Okay. So he would be exposed to other gods instead of dwelling with his people, the people of Israel serving the most high God. Okay. That's what that means. Verse 20. So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. He's humbling himself. He's calling himself a flea. He's calling himself a servant. He's calling Saul, my Lord, not the most high God, but my Lord, calling him the king. He's humbling himself before the king, the anointed, because Saul is still king. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Mm, a small thing. 21. Now look at Saul's response. I have sinned. I have sinned. Return my son, David, for I will harm you no more because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool, the fool and erred, erred exceedingly. Okay. Listen to how he's speaking. See, your kindness against your enemy will turn the heart of your enemy from evil to good. Think of that. Let God fight your battles. Now, 22, and David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. Not one of your, <laughs> David's not stupid, not one of your skilled soldiers, not your commander. Let one of your young men come before I think they're going to harm me. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Listen to that. And indeed, verse 24, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Wow. Let God deliver me. Let God deliver me. Let God fight my battles. Let God deliver me. 25, then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. Wow. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. Note, David placed no confidence <laughs> Okay, get this now. That little simple statement right there. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. It didn't say David went with Saul. Why? Because David placed no confidence in his professions or promises. He's doubled back on his promises and took them back already. So he wisely kept at a distance. That's what that statement meant. Okay, he kept his distance to see with Saul actually live up to his word, okay? You see, that was a lot to unpack in that simple chapter 26, and I hope that was able to bless you. So now let's move on to chapter 27. Because I know you probably have some questions about chapter 28. Okay, David allied with the Philistines. That title don't even sound right, you know. David allied with the Philistines. But there was a purpose for this, okay? And I hope you caught the purpose in your reading. And remember, I always tell you what to read at the end of every session for the next session. Hopefully you're being obedient and read your chapters ahead of time. This is just three or four chapters you can read per week. Now you should, we're in the Old Testament. You should be reading in your normal, let me make sure to say this, in your normal devotional reading, you should be reading New Testament chapters. Because we are reading in the Old Testament, you should be spending time reading on the life of the Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. You should spend time reading the New Testament in your own personal devotional reading time, okay? We're in the Old Testament in Bible study, but still pick up chapters during the week and read the, Old, read the New Testament, okay? 
David allied with the Philistines. Verse 27, let's see what this is about. And David said in his heart, in his heart, he said, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hands. I'm going to go to the enemy's camp to be protected in the enemy's camp. David would not, I mean, Saul would not follow me there. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. David arose and went over with the 600 men that he was with, okay, who were with him to Achish or Achish, um, the son of the king of Gath, okay? He was the king of Gath, okay? The son of Maosh, I believe it is, the king of Gath, Gath, G-A-T-H, Gath. So David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the king of Gath. Verse three, so David dwelt with the king of Gath, Achish, he and his men, each man with his household, so it was his men and the men's household, and David with his two wives, okay? So, and it was told to Saul that David had fled to Gath. So he sought him no more. You see verse four? Now, think about this. Verse four ended by saying, so he sought him no more. Semicolon, so he sought him no more. But why did he seek him no more? Before the semicolon, it says, it was told Saul that David fled to Gath. So that's the reason why he sought him no more. What am I getting at? What are you trying to say, Rev? The reason should have been he sought him no more because David spared his life twice. But that's not what it says. It says he sought him no more because David fled to the Philistines. So remember I said David did not trust him and did not trust his words because he had already doubled back on his words before, right? So now we see David was correct. If he could have sought him, he would have. So then verse five, then David said to the king, Achish, if I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? David's being slick now. He's being slick. You need to catch what he's doing. He's saying, I'm not a Philistine. So why should I dwell in your royal city with the king? Let me be protected. But he's saying, I want to be protected in your region to where Saul can't reach me, but send me afar off to where you can't see me either, to where you can't reach me either, okay? And there was a reason for this. So verse six, so Achish gave him Ziglag. Oh my God, I preached a whole sermon about Ziglag. Um, Ziglag that day. Therefore, Ziglag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day because of this very act, okay? To this day. Now, the king that, uh, now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. So he had left the royal city. He dwelt with them for a full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided, get this now, the, the Gesher sites, the Gerzitites, Gerzitites, and the Amalekites. Okay, these words throw you for a loop. I know they, uh, I get tongue twisted, guys. So let's not worry about that. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Sir, even as far as the land of Egypt. He raided these three regions or these three people. He was far enough from the king so the king would not see or hear of this. But let me not get ahead of myself. Number, verse nine, whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel and returned and came to Achish. 
David destroyed every living person. Okay. Let's keep moving. Then Akish would say, verse 10, um, where have you made a raid, raid today? And David would say, against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremelites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. Mm. He's not saying specifically where he was, just in the southern area. Now, David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath. See, the scripture is telling you why he did it. Least they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. David made sure there was no one to rat him out. There was no one to snitch on him. David made sure of this. He killed everybody. Okay. And now you're saying, wait a minute. <clears throat> this is the same David. Now, excuse me, my sinuses are killing me today. Um, this is the same David that spared the life of Saul, such a great man. So why is he killing everybody? Well, you have to remember, if you've been in Bible study all this time, you know, God said that these regions of these people would be utterly destroyed and they were not utterly destroyed. So now he's using David to utterly destroy them. Why do I use that phrasing? Well, let's look at verse 12. So Achish believed David. Yeah, he was lying to the king because this was, he was doing the work of the Lord people. He was undoing a mistake that had been done before when the people were supposed to be destroyed, who fought against Israel. So now we see God will put you, embed you in the enemy's camp. He will protect you in the enemy's camp and allow you to fulfill a mission to fulfill his purpose in the enemy's camp. Mm, my God. You see that? So it says, so Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. Wow. He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. The servant of the king of the Philistines. Really? Do you really think that was going to happen? Okay. Now, I put a special note in there for you. Those of you guys that are by audio, you can't see the note, so let me read it for you. The Gesherites, the Gerzites, the Amalekites were under the ban commanded by the Torah. Remember Torah, the laws of Moses that we went over, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? In Deuteronomy 20, I put the exact scriptures in there for you. Deuteronomy 20, verse 16 through 17. It spoke on these people would be utterly destroyed. None of them was to be spared by the Israelites in warfare. David, the man after the Lord's own heart, was careful to follow the prescribed rules of warfare. Thus, whenever he attacked the area in verse 9, Inhabited by these people, he did not leave a man or woman alive. However, he did take the booty of it, the sheep, the cattle, the donkeys, the camels, and all of that, part of which was presented to Achish on his periodic visits to the king. So he would raid people, take the king, take the bounty of it, the booty of it, and then present that to the king as a blessing to the king for allowing him or protecting him or allowing him to dwell in the land. But he was doing the work of the Lord people and this king of the Philistines didn't even know it, okay? He was doing the work of the Lord, all right? So now let's go over this last chapter 28 because I have to say some things at the end of this. Saul consults a medium. That's exactly what it says, medium or soothsayer or witch. Okay, either one you want to say. She a witch, she a soothsayer, she's a median, a conjurer up of evil spirits. Okay, a witch, the black arts, satanic, pagan practice that was going on throughout all the land. Remember what I tell you over and over again in this day and time, the children of Israel was the holy nation 
everyone else was pagan. Everyone else was satanic. Everyone else was serving multiple gods. Everyone else was serving Satan. Okay. Keep that in your mind when you see these things. Why did David attack these people? They were evil demonic people. Okay. Chapter 28. Okay. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David is to battle against his own people. Hmm. Let's see how that goes. So David said to Achish, surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore, I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. So you see how well and skilled he is in military, so uh, in battle. So he says, I will make you my chief guardians, which he did not know he was killing the Philistines. <laughs> Saul consults a median. Now, Saul, Samuel had died. Samuel had died. And all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. That's important. That's important. That's why we're going over it. And Saul had put the Medians and spiritists out of the land. I like how it said spiritist, like we said prophet and prophetess. <laughs> That's an inside joke. Saul had put the Medians and spiritists out of the land. Okay. That's important to know. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all of Israel together and encamped in Geboa. Now, Saul saw the army of the Philistines, how great they were, and he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. Now, if God was with him, he wouldn't be afraid, but God is not with him anymore, okay? And when Saul inquired of the Lord, Yahweh, large L, the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim, or by the prophets. Remember, this was the answer to your question, your pop question that I gave you last time. Um, and the answer to that question was the Urim, U-R-I-M, and Thunum. That was what the priests used to say yea or nay, that they kept in their robes and their ephod, okay? And that's what I meant. Why did he bring the ephod? Because they had the Urim and the Thunum, okay? So verse 7, if that's for those guys that was with me last, last time, last session. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium. Now, wait a minute. The previous verses just says he put away all the medium and soothsayers. Now he says, find, this is how desperate he is. Find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. He did not want to appear to be the king because he had already um, expelled these people and said that he would kill them if, if, if they were found in the land. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. And I'll show you how we know that because you said, how do you know that? I will show you how we know that. Verse eight, Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes and he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night. And he says, Please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Okay. You can see movies today with witches doing uh, uh, seances and all this. That's evil. That's satanic people. Okay. Verse nine. Then the woman said to him, look, pay attention to this. This is how I know what was done earlier. She says, look, you know what Saul has done previously, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? Scripture upon scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. This scripture explains itself. Now you know what Saul commanded previously. Are you with me? Do you catch that? Now you know what he said previously because the scripture just explained itself. 
Why didn't you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? So Saul gave a command that they was to be expelled from the land or they would die. It didn't tell you that four verses up, but it just told you that in verse nine. That's why we're doing Bible study this way. You can't do Bible study pulling out one verse, people. You got to look at the whole chapter, the whole book together. That's the only way it's going to make sense. That's why our people today don't know the word because they're going over one verse at a time. Go over the whole chapter, go over the whole book. Stay in that book until you learn it. Moving right along, verse 10. And Saul swore to her by the Lord saying, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. And the Lord shall never die. So that means forever, okay? Then the woman says, whom shall I bring up for you? After she's reassured, no harm shall come to her. She says, and, and he said, bring up Samuel for me. Mm. When the woman, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. <clears throat> Don't miss this. Verse 11 says, whom shall I bring up for you? Saul says, bring up Samuel for me. The very next thing says, the woman saw Samuel, comma, she cried out with a loud voice. Why would she do that? And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me for you are Saul? And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, the witch said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she says, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now that it changes, the speaker changes. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Oh my God, guys, it is so much in these scriptures. And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, Samuel has been dead. He dead dead, okay? So why do you ask me? Seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy. And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. He's already replaced you. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Be why? Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath from Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, verse 19, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. <laughs> what did he just say? You're calling me up from the dead. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, the dead. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Mm. Under your care, Israel will be captured. Again, immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid. 
because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all the day or all night. And the woman came to Saul. Yes, I'm going to impact those verses. Don't worry. We, we're going to go back to it. Immediately. I'm sorry, 21. And the woman came, the witch, came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice and I have put my life in my hands and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now, therefore, please heed also the voice of your maidservant and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and says, I will not eat. So his servants together with the woman urged him and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house and she hasted to kill it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. 25. So she broke it before Saul and his servants and they ate. They arose and went away by night. Now that concludes chapter 28. Okay. But we're not done with it. Okay. We're not done with it. Now. Mm, 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 mm. Let's go. What we have to deal with. What. Verse 12. Verse 11. And the woman says, whom shall I bring up to you? This is the witch talking. Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out. Why would she cry out if she called up a dead spirit and the spirit is before her? I know, <coughs> I know you have a lot of questions. So let's unpack this. That's why I made sure to finish early and only do three chapters so we could explain this. It's only 7.50. We got started at 8.02, 8.03, 8.04. So I got a good 15 minutes if I need it, okay? When she, she asks, shall I bring up for, who shall I bring up for you? The king says, bring up Samuel. Obviously it worked because she saw Samuel. Let's get that first. Then she cried out with a loud voice. Stop right there. You can do all the research you want to do on this and you're going to find a lot of information. But let me unpack some stuff for you. Out of, I spent a whole day on this one chapter. Okay. This denotes to us that this witch would conduct seances on a regular basis. But this denotes to us that they would never work. <laughs> okay. That's what this denotes to us. That she would do seances, but she actually sees the dead come before her now. When the woman saw Samuel, comma, immediately she cried out with a loud voice, period. It actually worked this time. Who she called up, that person came. If this was a normal occurrence for her, would she cry out with a loud voice? She wouldn't be surprised. If I call my daughter right now from the other room and she comes, why would I be surprised? Because normally when I call her, she comes. Or if I call my son from the other room and he always has his headphones on and he never comes because he's playing a video game. So if I call him every day, every day, he never comes. I got to get up and go get him. But this time I call him and he comes, I will be surprised because the normal occurrence is that he does not come. Are you with me, somebody? Because I'm teaching. Okay. So she cried with a loud voice because the normal occurrence is no one shows up when she's doing these satanic um, seances. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Second thing. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me for you are Saul? 
How does she know that? Very next sentence, same verse. How does she know that? Why? Leave it in the comments. Somebody comment real quick. How does she know that? Send me a, put it in the chat, put it in the comments. How does she know that? It's simple, okay? Which leads you to the answer of the whole thing of totality of how this happened. And we're gonna go over that. Why have you deceived me for you all saw? Okay. Something happened between her crying out with that loud voice and her next statement. Not only did she see Samuel, but she saw Saul for who he really was. How did that happen? It was revealed to her the whole situation in that instant. Well, how did that happen, Rhea? Well, we're going to see. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? Get it? What did you see? Not who did you see? What did you see? So now he's not asking her about Samuel. He's asking her, oh my God, did you miss this? I tell y'all to slow down, read every word. He's asking, you received some type of vision. Something was revealed to you. I can sit here and look at you and tell that something has been revealed to you. What was it? I need to know this. The woman says, I saw. People, it's right there in front of you. Did you miss it? I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she says, it's an old man. Now she's telling you what the vision was, what she saw. So things were revealed to her. A witch, things were revealed to her. An old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle and Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Wow. Now it switches to, now it switches to, Samuel is speaking. So now Samuel, spirit or form, is right there in front, or he can either hear him or see him. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? To let him know, yes, this is Samuel. Why have you disturbed me from bringing me up? Okay. Now, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I called you. Verse 16, listen to the words carefully at 16. So why do you ask me seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? Okay, now that was okay. But look at how he finishes up. Well, how he continues. 17, and the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. There it is. He's telling Saul what he has already told him. So what is that? That is confirmation that this is actually Samuel. He's not telling him something new, people. I'm getting excited. Let me calm down. Whew. Let me calm down. Okay. Oh, my God. Praise God. This is something he has already told him. This is confirmation, people. The Lord, 17, the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me previously. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. How would he know all this if he wasn't Saul? I mean, wasn't Samuel. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fears wrath from um, Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. You see, you see that? Then not only, oh my God, he's speaking to him in the present. The Lord has done this to you this day. How verse 18 ended. 16, 17, and 18 spoke of past tense of what Samuel has already said to him previously before Samuel died. Did you get that? Thirdly, Thirdly, now Samuel is telling him prophetically what will happen in the future. 
Verse 19, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Oh my God, there it is. You see how much it is to impact in those short scriptures? Right there. He spoke of him in the present. He spoke of him in the past, what has happened before, what I have already spoken to you before. And now he's speaking to him in the future. You dying tomorrow, buddy, for everything that you've done. You will be with me in this earth. Mm, covered up in your tomb. This is what's going to happen. So why do I need to unpack all of that? Okay. When you do your research, there are two different, I'm reading from my notes now, people, those of you guys that can't see the notes. There are two different school of thoughts about this medium or this witch or soothsayer or this satanic person um, or this encounter. There's two different school of thoughts, okay? Half of the people say, the scholars, the theologians say, the woman deceived Saul and she had an accomplice there that was standing in the dark, working with her to appear to be Samuel. That's the first school of thought. That's what half the theologians say. The other half of the theologians say that Samuel really appeared to her. Okay? You get it? Two things. Now, questions naturally arise at this point. Okay? Did the median actually make contact with a living spirit being? And if so, was it really the prophet Samuel? That's why I was explaining all that, so you could draw your own conclusion. While this matter is not likely to be settled to everyone's satisfaction, meaning theologians, the following observations can be made. First, the plain statement of the Hebrew text is that the plain statement of the Hebrew text is that she did, in fact, see Samuel. That's what the text says. Second, the median reacted to Samuel's appearance as though it was genuine and terrifying experience to her. Why? She cried out at the top of her voice or with a loud voice. Her strong reaction also suggests that Samuel's appearance was unexpected. Did I not say that? Perhaps this was the first time she had ever actually succeeded in contacting the dead. Third, the, the speeches attributed to Samuel contained allusions to a prior interchange between the two or prior com conversation or event between the head in the past. Allusions that would have been appropriate only for the real Samuel to have made. Fourthly, Samuel's role and message as a prophet, so much a part of his ministry and life, was unchanged in his encounter with Saul here. Prophet, prophetic. He told him he would die the next day. Are you hearing me now? Are you hearing me? An alternative reading of this passage suggests that it was not the skill of the median. Here we go. Here we go but rather a unique act of God that brought Saul into contact with Samuel. The median did not possess the capacity, hear me somebody, to disturb a dead saint, but God, somebody say, but God, as a sign of his grace permitted Saul to have one last encounter with the prophet who had played such a determinative role in the king's career. Mm, there it is. The median did not possess the capacity to call up the dead people. Oh my God, if you knew how many questions I got on this this week. So you're telling me that the devil can call up the dead and you're telling me that this and that, mm, 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 mm. no sir, no ma'am, 
no son, no daughter, no person. That is not what the scripture is saying. You have to do your due diligence. You have to do your homework. It was not the skill of the witch, but rather a unique act of God that brought Saul into contact with Samuel. Yahweh, the most high God, allowed Saul to hear the voice of Samuel one more time, one more time, even in this atmosphere of a wicked soothsayer. But if you read it carefully, you saw even the witch, the soothsayer, the spiritist was surprised, so surprised that she cried out with a loud voice. This had never happened to her before. So no, they do not have the power to call up the dead. Not a dead saint, it said. They do not have that power. They did not have that power to do this, people. God even allowed Saul to hear the voice of a dead saint to give him one last encounter before he died. And this was the grace of God. God spared his life multiple times. That was the grace of God. God's grace and his mercy. And you and I cannot talk because we need the grace and mercy of God every single day of our lives, okay? If it wasn't for the grace, where would we be? Amen? Amen. I hope that answered your questions. I hope that blessed you. That concludes session 80 of Back to Basic Bible Study. We covered chapters of 1 Samuel. We covered chapters 26 through 28. We're going to finish 1 Samuel next week. So read 29, 30, and 31. Amen? And make sure in your personal reading that you are reading chapters in the New Testament as well. Okay? All right. I love you. I love you. I love you. May God bless you. May God keep you as my prayer. Um, I always, always, always tell you that I thank you, that I love you. Please, if you're watching by YouTube, hit the subscribe button, like and share, hit the notifications bell. So many people watch it, but only a few subscribe. Please subscribe, like the videos. You got 80 to like, like them all. Okay. I love you guys. Thank you for coming on. And as we always say, and I close in prayer, pray with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May this word grow as seed in your spirit and manifest in your heart. May your love of God grow through your knowledge of God's word. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. See you next week for Back to Basics Bible Study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Amen.